As people become more and more disillusioned with AAA gaming, there seems to be this increasing appreciation for smaller indie projects. I mean, 80% of the indie genre is just acid flips and god awful games, but the cream of the crop tells a completely different story. These somehow deliver a richer and outright better experience than many high cost productions. The indie genre has always been prevalent in the gaming industry, but players are realizing that the best indie games are actual innovative and memorable pieces of work rather than just a mere cash grab or a half finished product that was frantically rushed through to meet deadlines. But why am I mentioning the indie devs in this video? Well, there's a bigger, more dedicated group of devs that we need to talk about. To these developers, the content that they make is quite literally only limited by their creativity. Their passion for game development and design leads them to work without pay, and in fact, most of them don't even seek to make money off their inventions. I'd say that their craft is the ultimate testament to innovation, dedication, and their respective gaming communities. So join me as we spotlight the gaming industry's most devoted contributors, the modders. The word mod is short for modification, and in terms of gaming, it specifically refers to modifications made to pre-existing games that are made by fans of the property. Of course, in the modern era, we have a lot of tools at our disposal to dissect and change these games as we please, but the history of how this came to be is really interesting and dates all the way back to the 1980s. One of the first games to ever be modded was a little game called Castle Wolfenstein, which was developed by Muse Software and advertised as the most interactive game ever. You play as an American agent who was captured by the Nazis and transported to a secret facility for interrogation. And your objective is to find and locate secret documents while fighting through waves of these Nazis, shooting anyone that stands in your path. Initially released in 1981, Castle Wolfenstein was meant to be played on one of these devices. Yeah, this beautiful antiquity from the fossil record, also known as the Apple II home computer, also known as the pinnacle of microtechnology at the time, utilizing a whopping 4 kilobytes of RAM, and featuring the most high quality monochrome CRT monitor on the market. This miracle machine is actually really important to the history of gaming. The Apple II was one of the most popular home computers throughout the 1980s, and in addition to that, it was a great game development platform for devs to use. Its popularity and practicality brought the gaming industry to new heights as studios rushed to create games for this system. So even though Castle Wolfenstein was later ported to other devices, it was always the most popular on the Apple II. The game was extremely fun and addicting, and it wasn't overly complicated. Plus, you were shooting Nazis. It became one of the most popular and best-selling games of its time, selling approximately 50,000 copies in two years. In fact, it became so popular that in the summer of 1983, two young fans of the game, named Andrew Johnson and Preston Nevins, got to work on their own spin-off of the game. They decided that rather than fighting through hordes of Nazis, they replaced the enemies with Smurfs. You are now playing as Smurf Butcher Bob, an agent who was captured by the secret military underground resistance force and transported to their top secret base. Your new objective? Kill any Smurf on sight and seal the plans to Operation Smurf Krieg thus saving the world from complete annihilation from these rabid monsters. And needless to say, it was an extremely popular premise. On his website, Johnson describes the process of creating this conversion as fairly straightforward, only requiring a paint program, a sector editor, and Muse Software's text-to-speech program, called The Voice. So with those three wonderful pieces of technology, Johnson and Nevins pioneered game modding. They produced the industry's first mod, aptly named Castle Smurfenstein. And from this one goofy ass mod, developers began to realize the potential that player created content held. With the internet's exponential rise in popularity, gamers were now able to form their own communities, where they could bounce ideas and share their own mods between each other. One example of this was noted by Scott Miller who was the CEO of publishing company Apogee Software Productions at the time. 
he noticed that players were creating their own levels for the 1991 platformer Duke Nukem, and they were even developing and sharing their own level editors with each other. Quote, we just didn't expect players to take the time and effort to create their own development tools. Mods allowed players to experience their favorite games from a new perspective, and they were also a healthy sign of an active fan base. However, the spark that really ignited the modding scene actually comes back around to the Wolfenstein franchise. In December of 1991, the newly formed id Software had to decide on what project they wanted to work on next. John Romero, co-founder of the company, explained that they first came up with an idea called It's Green and Pissed. And so one of the things, one of the ideas that Tom had was he called it It's Green and Pissed. That was like the, the, the title of the game. And it was like, so it's like a research lab and, and the scientists are, you know, experimenting and there's mutants and they're killing everybody and you go in there and you blast your way out and all this stuff. And I was just like, man, that is like the oldest story in the book. I totally don't want to play that game. You know, and so I'm just like, why not like remake Wolfenstein in 3D? It was funny because it was like Carmack and Tom and I were all like, yeah, like it was instantaneous, like obviously, yes. And so they set out to create Wolfenstein 3D, which was heavily inspired by Castle Wolfenstein. The narratives of both games were very similar. An American agent gets captured by the Nazis and is taken to their secret lair, where he then has to break out of there and cripple their regime. There were a couple of notable differences though, like how the top-down view of its predecessor was replaced with first-person shooter mechanics, enemy variation was greater, there were story missions now, it was grittier, it was faster, it was bloodier, it was just all around better. People fell in love with everything about this game, the violence, the sound design, missions, immersive factor, and the list goes on. A game of this caliber was unprecedented in the gaming industry, and as a result, players wanted to modify it. Unfortunately, while modding Wolfenstein 3D was possible at the time, it was very difficult. Simply put, the game's files were a lot more inaccessible, meaning that less people were willing to create mods for the game. However, instead of turning away from the community, id actually recognized the problem. They understood that mods were an integral part of the player's enjoyment, and because of the community's struggles to work on Wolfenstein, they decided to make their next project extremely mod-friendly. Their next game would package all of its sprites, graphics, and game data in specific .wed files, which is short for Where's My Data. And this packaging permitted modders to easily work with files to their heart's content, allowing the modding scene for this game to explode in popularity. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this magical game, which took the industry by storm, was called Doom. To say that Doom was popular at launch would be an extreme understatement. The game transcended the gaming community. Hell, people who didn't even use the internet at the time were hearing about this shit. Id Software set revolutionary standards for the industry in many ways, but one of its brightest spots was its large modding community. Like I mentioned, Doom was the first popular modding hotspot, which formed due to the ease at which players could access game files. Also, the community was working on developer tools to streamline the process even further. A little more than a month after the game's release, Brendan Weber released the Doom editing utility, which was Doom's first level editor. A few months after that, a modder named Jeffrey Bird created the first custom WAD file for Doom. It wasn't anything too complicated, but shortly after its release, more people were sharing their own mods through old school bulletin boards. Id Software took note of all this commotion and were actually inclined to hire members of the Doom modding community because of their work. For example, they sought out the most talented creators to create the 21 master levels for Doom 2. And some other id approved mod packs include Maximum Doom and Final Doom. Some of the best modders ended up being hired by studios to work on actual games. Tim Willits' contributions to the master levels landed him a job as a lead designer at id. Dario Casali was hired by Valve to work on Half-Life, and Kenneth Scott became the art director at id and later worked at 343. You don't want to be like this. My point is, Doom laid the foundation for what modding was to become. There was a mutual agreement forming between players and developers, 
where devs were willing to give the players the abilities to modify their games, and these mods would drastically increase the game's replay value. It was a win-win situation for both sides, and because of this, both the quantity and quality of mods drastically improved. Modders went from creating simple levels to completely redesigning guns, pickups, enemy types, map layouts, and practically anything that you could see or interact with in the game. This was a new era for gaming. All of this is just the start. In 1996, id Software released Quake, which gave rise to a completely new community of modders. One of these Quake mods was a tiny little project named Team Fortress, which had a small but active player base. The game was essentially a class-based online multiplayer, but while the devs were working on TF2, they were hired by Valve Incorporated to port TF1 to their Gold Source engine. This was the first time that a mod created by players became its own standalone title. Of course, there was the famous Chex Quest from 1996, which was a mod for Doom, but that was sponsored by a serial company. Team Fortress was revolutionary in the sense that it was once an independent mod that then became its own game and eventually spawned a sequel that is still relevant today. And Valve's contributions to the modding community span far beyond this game. Another extremely popular franchise spawned from their Gold Source engine, called Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike was originally a mod for Half-Life, co-created by Min Lee and Jesse Cliff in 1999. In a particular interview during which he was asked about the mod's development, Min Lee described it as a balance between the fast-paced, skill-based gameplay of Quake and the more teamwork-oriented style of Rainbow Six. Also, he got the concept of no respawning from another mod that he made for Quake, called Action Quake. Certainly, Counter-Strike's simplistic yet tactical nature impressed many players and devs alike, including the aforementioned Valve. It made such a strong impression on Valve that they bought the Counter-Strike IP and asked both Min Lee and Jesse Cliff to continue their development under the studio's wing, which they both agreed to. Counter-Strike The Game was released in 2000, and its commercial success caused Valve to release three sequels, the most popular one of those currently being CSGO. In addition, when Valve switched from Gold Source to Source Engine, even more mods were becoming standalones. Gary's mod and the Stanley Parable both started as a Half-Life 2 mod. Dota was first a Warcraft 3 mod that Valve acquired, and then they hired its dev Icefrog to design Dota 2. But while Valve was a major contributor to this process, there are other examples of games originating from mods. Antichamber, for example, was first a mod for Unreal Tournament 3 called Hazard The Journey of Life. DayZ was a mod for Arma 2 that became so popular, it's credited with selling an additional 300,000 copies of Arma 2 within two months of the mod's release. And in more recent times, PUBG was a mod for Arma 3, but its development is super interesting. You see, before Brendan Green developed Player Unknown Battlegrounds, he made a mod for Arma 2 called DayZ Battle Royale, which he then transitioned into Arma 3. So, PUBG, or the genesis of the battle royale craze in gaming, came from the mod of a mod. And as modding has become more mainstream, the communities that these games have fostered have become extremely talented. For almost any game that you can think of, there are mods that change how everything looks, completely revamp gameplay mechanics, add new quests and storylines for you to follow, allow you to dabble in your more uh, promiscuous side. That's some respectable power right there. All right, I'm sorry about that. Item randomizers, huge mod packs to make your game 10 times more complex, bug fixes and patches to make them run more smoothly. Modders exist for almost every game on the market, ranging from your turn-based struggles to your colony sim escapades. And over the years, some studios and publishers have done a great job of supporting modding ventures by providing the tools and engines to do so. Overall, throughout its long history, modding has never become obsolete, and modders have continued to demonstrate their passion for their communities. But why? Why do some modders spend exorbitant amounts of time constructing a mod? Why thoughtfully weave together a mod with barely any monetary compensation to go along with it? Like 50 or 40 minute round, I thought, okay, this is, this, is, this is what I want to play. So that's kind of where it came from. I wanted to play a game. And I made the game and other people just like happened to like it too, which is, I count like myself lucky. Some of the best games come out of that. You, you create something that, that oh, you yeah. love and, and other people love Look it too. Look at the, the biggest games in the last 10, 15 years, like CSGO, Dota, 
league almost and like these all come from mods you know and it, they all come from people that are not like limited by either an exec level or people telling modders make mods because it's fun modding is like any other hobby it's fun to work on the games that you're a fan of i'd say that the vast majority of modders don't look for money as an incentive that sense of community and the sense of satisfaction that comes about when you make a mod and watch other people play and critique it is a lot more rewarding and to that end Modders and indie developers are very alike. There are tens of thousands of indie games that you could play through on Steam, yet we really only talk about the top 1% of them. And while there are a couple of outrageous cash grabs, most indie games are just small little projects that a dev made for the hell of it. Creating a game from scratch is a labor of love, and frankly, most of these labors end in a product that isn't the greatest, but the entire process is like a learning experience. It teaches you about game creation, it's an output for creativity, it's a way to give back to the games that you play. And all of this applies to modding. Modding is a way for fans to give their creative interpretation of a game by adding something that they thought would fit within their universe, no matter how absurd or stupid it looks. It supports games by prolonging their shelf life and brings back previous players who fell out with the game after they beat it. It's a way to become more familiar with game development, from the nitty gritty code work to asset creation to sound engines to basically every single step of the process. So, in a nutshell, modding is great.